Is the housing market about to crash if it hasn't already? That is the ultimate question that affects us all. Well, we're here to examine the direction of the housing market and what you can do to protect yourself from a potential move in housing prices with our next guest, who is an expert on real estate. Austin Rogers is the Associate Vice President of the Private Capital Markets Group at Equiton. Austin, pleasure having you on my show, The David Lynn Report. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much, David. I appreciate you uh, having me on to the show for this time around. I uh, did want to thank you for being one of the first guests. I am quite honored to be on the David Lynn Report and really looking forward to chatting with you back and forth about real estate and you know what we see coming over the next couple of years, right? Honored to host you and uh, Equiton. Let's talk about the market itself. Now, I know a lot of people watching this show uh, might be based in the U.S. or perhaps abroad. You are an expert on Canadian real estate, so we will use the Canadian real estate as a proxy to further understand exactly how your research process works and what affects the real estate market here in Canada. Because the main macro drivers behind the Canadian real estate market could be applied to the U.S. as well. What is your view on where interest rates are headed? That is the ultimate question people have been asking me personally when they want to know about real estate in Canada is how much higher can interest rates go? How much higher can mortgage rates go? It's a great question and it's a complicated one to answer. <laughs> but the interesting part about it is that for the first time, we've actually seen that the Canadian interest rate increases have now diverged from what the U.S. is doing. So the U.S. is still on a path of increasing at around a quarter basis point in the last meeting. And that's what we project is going to be happening in the next meeting as well, too. But today, Canada's come out and held the rate. So I think that is quite interesting, considering the fact that inflation is still sitting around 5.9% in Canada. Obviously, the benchmark that we all want to get to is the 2% mark, both here as well as in the United States. But I think what the Bank of Canada right now is doing is giving Canadians a bit of a pause. I really don't think we've seen the last of it because the labor market is still strong. We're still seeing quite a bit of wage growth. And when you have all these factors that look really positive, it means that there's even more room for the government to continue to increase that interest rate to try to bring down the factors to closer to that 2% nominal level. Now with the US, recently we have seen them come out and say that they are going to be going higher and for longer. You know, they are gonna be doing everything they can to combat this spiraling inflation. And so by doing so, Canada can't get left in the dust and just remain at the same interest rate because it doesn't work for our economy. So generally speaking, we do have to remain in line with what they are doing. We did jump the gun by doing a 50 basis point increase a couple months back where the U.S. had only gone up about 25. So we went a little higher. So maybe this is our chance to kind of slow it down for a period of time. But overall, I think you're going to continue to see the U.S. go higher than that 5% overnight rate, probably closer to the 5.25 or 5.5% area. And so by nature, we're going to be forced to show our hand and move that interest rate a little bit higher as well, too. I think this is just a bit of a pause for Canadians to take a breather, see where interest rates are sitting at right now, and allow everyone to kind of reevaluate their plans. Everyone is talking about a Fed pivot. Can we extend the same analysis to Canada? When can you expect the Bank of Canada to pivot, either in terms of stopping rate hikes altogether and then finally lowering rates again? What economic indicators do we need to see before that happens, Austin? Yeah, I mean, I think it's you know, an answer that none of us really want to hear. But unfortunately, I think that one of the biggest indicators is going to be unemployment. Um, it's one of the few ways you can kind of slow down the economy. And because the labor market is so strong right now, it gives them the ability to have that leeway to continue to increase rates. So unfortunately, I think we do need to see the labor market come down a little bit. I think we need to see wage growth come down. I think unfortunately, unemployment does need to go back up. Because these are some of the factors that allow us to kind of slow down the demand across the economy. And effectively, I think this is going to take longer than what people think. And so that is why I could still see the U.S. getting to five and a half percent likely over the next three to six months. And higher for longer means that this isn't going to be a short term time frame where you sit at that five and a half percent mark. We could very well see these rates sitting there for probably six months to a year until we see inflation get below that three and a half percent mark and starts to trend down towards that nominal two percent number we're all looking for 
quite honestly, I think we're looking probably six months more of increases and probably another six months to a year of sitting at these rates to really allow all of the economic conditions to bring themselves back towards that 2% mark. I have heard some talk recently where we may be comfortable with the 2 to 3% range. And that's why I truly think we need to see the inflation get to that 3.5% mark on a declining average before we're really going to see any pauses in the rates. I really think we're looking at about 12 months to 16 months there. Okay, so 12 to 16 months is your forecast for how long this rate hike cycle will last. Thank you for that. We're all wondering what the answer would be to that very important question. So thanks for going over that with us. Now, I'm wondering, Austin, is there a relationship between the interest rate level or the direction of interest rates and home prices? I mean, intuitively, there is or there should be. But does the data prove that theory? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a relationship to it. And, you know, I kind of look at the market in two different ways. There's going to be the people who are buying their single family homes. Um, you know, these are longer term purchases. And so this is something where you want to grow, you know, have a family, kind of expand or, you know, make your permanent residence versus there's another side of the market that's looking at it more from an investment perspective. And that is the market that is directly correlated with the interest rate increases. So, you know, the one thing I always say to people is if you're looking to buy a property, and it's going to be your forever home, or you're going to keep it for 10 years, marry the property and date the rate. The rate might be high for right now, but you know if you go onto a variable rate mortgage, you will eventually see some relief when it does start to come down ever so slightly. But at the end of the day, if you're willing and able to afford that mortgage, the stress tests in Canada in particular are quite high to ensure that anyone who is getting themselves into a mortgage can afford the property. So if you can and are able to buy a property, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And if you're buying it as a personal vehicle, it's still a good time to get in if you need to. To the flip side though, if you are someone who is an investor, particularly let's say into single family homes or condos, now's a tough time to be able to make those numbers work. You know, no matter kind of which way you slice and dice it, if you were to try and go out and buy a property today with 20% down, you know, the, the price to rent ratio is so high at the moment that it, it really kind of foregoes any idea that the rent you'll be able to get from that property will be able to make you cash flow positive. In a lot of cases, you might be neutral or in fact, paying money out of pocket to buy that investment property at the moment. Now, let's talk about uh, indicators that may show where the markets are going. Some people have told me, and this is just an extreme uh, opinion that the market, the housing market in the U.S. is about to crash. I've even heard the opinion that it could be as bad as 2008, and we all remember what that was like. Uh, one of the indicators they're looking at for uh, for this view is housing inventory pending home sales in the U.S. I'm, not, I'm just using the U.S. as an example because I have the data. If you look at the St. Louis Fed data, about a year ago in, Ju uh, in June 2021, there were roughly 600,000 units across the country. Now that's dropped down to about half that level, which is a significant drop. People are looking at this as a sign that the housing market has already softened and is on its way down even further. How would you interpret this data? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's an interesting sort of thought process there. But, you know, Canada is a little bit of a different market to that extent. And I think that we have a very unique supply demand imbalance here. You know, one thing you look at is that we have the least amount of homes available on the G7. Like no matter which way you slice it, we are so far behind with housing inventory right now that it is becoming increasingly hard to find supply available in the marketplace. You know, I challenge anybody to, to just go on realtor.ca, go on condos.ca, check out some of these websites where you can look at listings that are available and really just have a glance at what's available across the country at any given point in time. Because what you'll find right now is any sort of market that you pick a pocket in, there's very little that is available. And when you do find something available, the sale prices range so dramatically because some people are still caught in the 2022 pricing mindset versus others are pricing it low, still trying to generate the buzz in the marketplace. So what I think you'll find with Canada in particular is that the demand is going to continue to be strong here. You know, Because when you look at housing starts in Canada, um, you know, some data I was looking at recently is that we've only built in the last 12 months a little over 200,000 new units of supply. That encompasses both purpose-built rentals along with single dwellings. And if you look at the immigration that we're bringing into the country right now, it's averaging about 500,000 people per year. 
And we're expected to keep doing so for the next three to five years. So if we've already got a supply issue as it stands today, we're only going to be continuing to make that worse over the next three to five years because there hasn't been substantial increases in housing starts. And you know, recently we've seen this foreign home buyer ban come into place. A lot of foreign investors are looking to build purpose-built rentals. So not only do we have a problem today, not only do we have a problem with the immigration and the housing starts, we've now put a new ban in place that might even slow the development of new purpose-built rentals. So I think Canada is a very interesting market where there's an increasingly high demand for property here, while at the same time, we haven't cut the red tape on development to be able to bring the inventory up to where it should be. And so pricing may remain at a pretty stagnant level for these next 12 to 24 months, even in the face of these interest rate increases. Okay. I want to draw our attention to uh, one of the slides that you've presented here to me. And this one's entitled Private Canadian Apartments, and it shows uh, in the orange line shows uh, the index of private Canadian apartments versus the two other asset classes you have your global equities and Canadian equities. And what this chart shows is that over the last 30 years or so, all the way back to the mid 80s, the Canadian housing market has outperformed global and Canadian equities by a substantial margin. What's more interesting to me, Austin, is the fact that this index has never dipped on a five year rolling basis, even during the great financial crisis of 2008, even during COVID even during the last two years when the, some pockets of the U.S. housing market have been softening. How is this possible, <laughs> is my question. Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the, the most important factors of sort of the conversation between you and I today is really starting to differentiate, you know, what type of real estate asset class are we talking about, right? Because traditionally, when you read most of the headlines, it's about single family homes and condos. I mean, that's what, you know, we, the public are generally keeping an eye on. That's what we want to buy for ourselves. But there's another category that doesn't seem to get the same amount of attention and it's private Canadian apartments. You know, at Equiton, we, we love apartment buildings. It's one of the biggest categories that we actually focus on. And so the data you're actually looking at here is from MSCI and it's been tracked all the way back, as you can see here, up to about 1984. And what it's really looking at is the privately held Canadian apartment buildings as an index. Now, when you deal with an apartment building, it's much different than a residential home. It's not valued based on any emotion. It's not based on comparables of what something sold for down the street. When you have an apartment building, it's dealt with like a business. You know, there's a certain amount of revenue you generate from it. There's a certain level of expenses and there's an NOI at the end of the day, your net operating income. And traditionally speaking, this is how apartments are valued based on the revenue expenses and, you know, basically profit it generates at the end of the day. So when you have this more streamlined model, it's not based on emotions. And, you know, one of the most recent, you know, situations we can account for was COVID-19, you know, March of 2020, where the public market basically dropped like crazy in that specific month. But the analogy I always gave to people was if you owned an apartment building with 100 units in it. And that 100 units was generating you a profit of half a million dollars a year, let's say. Well, that dictates a certain value. So in March 2020, when the public markets dropped because everybody got scared, everybody was selling their stocks on a secondary exchange. Did anything really change with that apartment building that you owned? Was it not generating half a million dollars in profit for you anymore? Assuming you were still able to maintain the same level of rent collection, didn't have any major issues with collecting rent from your tenants, the valuation is basically the same because if somebody's willing to pay you 10 million bucks to make a $500,000 profit, that's 5%. Somebody would still buy that property to generate that same level of profit. Okay. Uh, just to present to you another stat um, that may challenge that thesis, Austin, I've been hearing for the last 20 years that the Canadian housing market is in a bubble. So I'll let you evaluate that statement, whether or not you agree or disagree. But one of the metrics that people have used to make that conclusion is the price to rent ratio as well as a price to income ratio. Now let's just take the price to income ratio. That ratio has widened over the last 20 years as prices of Canadian single family homes, going back to single family homes, uh, that those prices have risen at a pace faster than income. Um, and that has presented a problem because locals are no longer to, able to afford some of the uh, larger homes. 
And what we've seen, especially in larger markets like Vancouver and Toronto, is that a lot of these properties are propped up by foreign buyers. And so one of the concerns is that if foreign money stops, the whole thing is going to fall, like a domino effect, hence a bubble. How would you evaluate that? Yeah, I think the, the, the foreign buying being on a ban, it's important to recognize that is only for a two-year period of time. Um, you know, I think even right now, they're looking to make changes to the policy to reevaluate whether it does apply to new developments in construction. Um, so very likely, there could be some changes here that actually bring some of that investment money back into the country to continue building the supply that we really need. But, you know, when you look at the Canadian housing market and you ask, you know, is it in a bubble? I think there's a few things that really kind of stop that thesis in its tracks. And, you know, one of the things here is that Canada is a great country to live in. It is a great place to be. It's always going to attract new people. There's a reason that we are bringing in half a million people to the country a year. It's a great place. There's a lot of opportunity for jobs. There's a lot of opportunity for growth. There's a lot of potential land for you know, new developments as the years progress. And at the end of the day, when you kind of look at things like you mentioned, like the price to rent ratio, it has grown tremendously over time. You know, If you look back all the way to the 2000s in Canada, you know, the price to rent ratio is somewhere around 50, right? And if you looked back to the financial crisis, it had gone from 50 to above 80. And then during the financial crisis, it dropped back to below 80. But then it continued its sort of natural trend. And eventually it got to 100 by about 2015. And then right before the pandemic, it was about 120. So no matter which way you look at it, there's always been sort of a natural growth rate to the price to rent ratio over the last 20 years. So effectively, we're always going to see this natural growth due to the unique supply, demand and balance we have here. And I think that could continue for some time, but is it in a bubble? If you had asked me in January of 2022, yes, yes, I would have thought that it was in a bubble. It's one of the reasons I actually sold most of my real estate holdings at the end of 2021. I had kind of foreseen that there may be some issues with rising interest rates over the next coming years. I kind of wanted out of most of my properties and I got into a rental because rents were still fairly cheap at the time. So I'm actually in a unique situation where I was able to participate in watching the prices of homes come down over the last 12 months and the price of rents go up at the exact same time. So yeah, if you'd ask me in January of 2022, is there a bubble? Yeah, I think so. But coming closer to today's point, you know, prices of homes have come down about 12 and a half percent. You've seen the you know, price to rent ratio come down to closer to about the 150 mark from its peak of about 160 last year. And I think that some of these metrics are pointing to a cooling down in the market. And with the interest rates continuing, I think we'll see a bit of you know, sustained depreciation on some of these charts and metrics. But throughout the next 20 years, I still think we see that natural growth rate that there's been over the last 20 years. There's one more challenge that just came from my mind, Austin, and that's the issue of yield. Now, suppose I were a homeowner of a rental property. Uh, and suppose that my property were in a rent controlled area. Well, what's happening right now is that my mortgage expenses are rising faster than my, the rent that I'm able to charge. And so my yield is getting compressed. Um, I'm looking ahead and I'm thinking, well, if this compression is going to last for another 12 to 16 months or perhaps even longer, why don't I sell this property now, take that money and buy a higher yielding asset or a higher yielding fixed income product instead? What would you say to me? Yeah, I think what I would be saying to you is, you know, have a look at Equiton and some of the things we're doing with our apartment REIT, for example, right? I think it has more to do with how you've set yourself up from a financial perspective over the last few years. And that's something that Equiton's done quite well. So I do agree. If you looked at the fixed income side, there's definitely been increases, right? Even if you went to the bank to get a GIC right now, rates are so much higher than they were about a year ago today, right? You can get four or 5%, depending who you're with right now. But when you look at an apartment REIT like ours, you actually start to find something quite interesting. And I'll give you some of the metrics from the company as it stands right now. You know, we own in this apartment REIT about $850 million worth of apartment buildings, you know, 32 buildings to be exact. And we have about 2,500 individual units or tenants paying rent to us on a monthly basis. So if we were buying properties at 80% loan to value and only putting 20% down, you'd probably be in a similar crunch where your effective yield after paying all your expenses would be quite low. But our company has always been buying properties at around a 50% loan to value. And actually, as of today, it's a little bit below 50% loan to value. And this leaves you a lot of buffer room. And so that's one of the reasons why when you look at a company like Equitom, we can still maintain a yield 
of about six plus percent. And actually more interesting than that, I think, is how we've set up the debt side of the portfolio. Because since 2016, when we started raising capital, we've been buying every single property with 10-year fixed rate mortgages. Now, traditionally speaking, a lot of homeowners and investors may not have been doing the same. And at the time, you could have made the argument that being on a variable rate was a better idea because it would have been slightly cheaper. But today, it looks like an amazing strategy because the average mortgage rate for our portfolio is sitting right around 3%. And the average term to maturity is upwards of seven years. So when you have a fund like this that is setting themselves up from a metric perspective to be very solid on your cost of capital, as well as term to maturities, you know, this rising interest rate environment still allows you to be competitive on the yield perspective, while not even factoring in any potential capital appreciation, just cash flow. I want to drill down a little bit deeper and understand the supply and demand, uh, the demand fundamentals a little bit more. I'm just going to read one paragraph from um, a report by the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation. This is their latest housing market outlook report. And one of the key highlights from the 2022 release is that we expect, quote unquote, we expect growth in prices, sales levels, and housing starts to moderate from recent highs, but remain elevated in 2022. Robust GDP growth, higher employment and net migration will support demand. In 2023 and 2024, the growth in prices will moderate with sales and starts activity remaining above long run averages. So just in the point of demand and net, net migration supporting these fundamentals, who are these buyers of apartments? Is it locals? Is it foreign buyers? You know, I'm seeing a lot of condos getting built in the metropolitan cities, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal. Who's buying these? Yeah, I think it, it kind of varies, right? Depending on the size of what you're really looking at. You know, I attend a lot of real estate conferences, um, you know, one just this last weekend, actually. And what I'm starting to find is that when you talk to real estate investors, more and more people are starting to look at the multifamily space as being one of the best places to park their money. So when you look at your day-to-day -day investor, I would actually think that a lot of them now are converting from going and buying condos to buying sixplexes, fourplexes, even duplexes for that argument, right? Because people are starting to realize the benefit of scaling a property, having multiple tenants in one property. And I think that when you look at sort of the day-to-day -day investor, they are actually starting to move into this multifamily investment space. Now, when you get into properties that start to exceed, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 million dollars plus, it starts to change the market a little bit. And a lot of those are now being scooped up by, I would say, public REITs, uh, private REITs, family offices. So it is going more so to the institutional grade side of things because the size of those assets are so large that it requires a ton of capital to even enter the market. But I would actually say when you talk to the day-to-day -day investor, they're really starting to realize the benefit of maybe going into the outskirts of the GTA, you know, outside of Toronto, looking for those duplexes, those triplexes, so that they can actually build out a model that is similar to sort of that private Canadian apartment index, because you find really solid returns when you get into multiple units. And I think that's where investors are starting to look at nowadays. And are you concerned about oversupply at all in any of these metropolitan areas? Oversupply? No. <laughs> I, think, I think we're so far behind on the supply side right now that, you know, we really need to do everything we can to sort of cut some of that red tape and allow for new development. You know, Equiton's in the development space as well, too, where we build things like condos, um, you know, we build townhomes. So we very much so are in the process of dealing with the city to go through some of those approvals at the same time. And, you know, there's still quite a lengthy process where even from acquiring a land to completion can be upwards of five to seven, in some cases, even closer to 10 years. So the hurdles of getting new supply on the market are extremely long. They're extremely capital intensive. And it is creating sort of that burden of continued supply issues over the next five to 10 years. I guess one argument for buying a rental property, especially in North America and Canada in particular, is that as prices increase in the future, if you believe that the valuations will continue to climb um, faster than incomes, well, younger people, millennials, Gen Zs and Ys perhaps may not be able to afford homes in the same uh, numbers as their parents or grandparents did. And so what, what are they going to do? They're going to rent. And so home ownership is going to decline, but rentership is going to increase. Do you agree? 
Yeah, no, I, I like 100% agree. You know, we've actually been looking at some stats recently and, um, you know, what we found is that the level of renters is increasing three times as fast as the level of homeowners. And I think this is a trend that's going to continue. You know, a big market of these renters is people in sort of the 20 to 30, you know, 35 category, because it's just so ridiculous to even go out and think about buying a property in Toronto, let alone even the outskirts of the GTA at the moment right now. So I do think there will be a continued trend of renters. But another side to this is there's always going to be a huge amount of generational wealth. And, you know, something I think we look at over the next five to 10 years is that we're going to see one of the biggest wealth transfers ever. You know, some of the money that's coming from this older population is going to start trickling down to some of the younger individuals. And this is going to continue to allow people to own real estate, move into different properties and have the equity to still be able to buy and sell into certain assets. So yes, I do think it's going to be tough for the traditional people in you know, that sort of 20 to 35 year old category. And that's why the rent is growing so high, but there's still always going to be a huge capacity of generational wealth that will be passed down and allow individuals to still be able to buy properties with the help of say their parents or somebody else in the family. So that's always going to be a big part of Canada's economy. Interesting. Uh, Now, let's talk about how REITs work. So can you give us a primer on how it's packaged and how you select properties? Yeah, for sure. So when you look at, you know, Equiton and the private REIT that we have here, you know, we like to call it the residential income fund, you know, really works no different, I would say, than going out and buying a rental property yourself. And this is where I always like to keep the analogy simple, because if you went out and bought a rental property, you'd expect to get three things from it. You would get rent on a monthly basis from your tenant. You would pay down the mortgage every month, which frees up a little bit of equity. And you hope that you can increase the valuation of that property over time. Those are the three things you're always looking for when you buy a rental. So when you get into a REIT, you're basically expecting the same things. And that's the benefit of buying into a REIT. Because what we do is we pay out monthly cash flow, the same as if you had owned the building and had a renter yourself. And for the pay down of the mortgage, as well as the value of the property going up, it's captured through the equity price of the investment going up, or kind of like the stock price going up. So you get to benefit from this monthly cash flow alongside the capital appreciation, as if you own the building yourself, but you're passing off all the legwork and management responsibilities to a professional company. And in our case, that's Equiton. So a REIT is really an advantageous way for you to get real estate exposure without having to do the work of a landlord. And in some cases, you can even take advantage of your accounts like RSPs and TFSAs, where you wouldn't traditionally be able to use your RSP to buy another piece of real estate. So this is a really great way to get exposure to that asset class. Would it be possible at any point of the product's life cycle for the uh, price to trade at a premium or a discount to net asset value? In other words, would there be like an arbitrage opportunity if let's say the read itself is much more expensive than the underlying properties? It's honestly one of my favorite questions. And I'm really glad you brought that up because you can buy REITs two different ways. You can go to the public market or you can buy them privately. If you go buy a REIT on the public market, it is going to have that opportunity for buying at a premium at certain times, but also buying at a discount to what the perceived NAV is or the net asset value of the fund at any given point in time. For example, March of 2020, There would have been a NAV on the fund, the net asset value for it. But in that specific month where everything sold off, a lot of public REITs would have come down at the same time as well. Meanwhile, the assets might have been remaining relatively the same. And so that would have been buying the REIT at a discount to its NAV. But the beautiful thing about buying a REIT on the private market is that the unit price of our investment or that NAV is based on the appraisal value of the underlying properties. And when you have appraisal values coming in for big institutional grade properties, it goes back to one of those things I was talking about at the beginning, where it functions like a business. So as long as you can maintain the collection of rents from your tenants, you know, maintain the expenses and moderate that NOI, you can hold that building's valuation incredibly constant. And it gives you the investor power of knowing that you're buying that REIT at what it's worth today. And if you see value in what that manager is doing, you can then participate in the growth of that NAV or unit price through purchasing that private REIT. I know in some jurisdictions in Canada, when you buy a home for the first time, you have to pay a first-time homeowner's tax. 
Does that apply to your product as well? Do I have to pay a tax to enter? No, there's no tax to enter. You're buying the uh, the product at the specific unit price at any given month. So no well, are there, taxes like land transfer tax on top. Are there any tax advantages of a REIT? There's some big tax advantages. So what happens with a REIT is that you are getting a monthly cash flow. Let's use our example of, let's say, 6% a year. But we pay it out on a monthly basis. So if you take that 6, it works out to about 0.5% a month. So let's use a $100,000 example. You put $100,000 in, you're going to get $500 a month or $6,000 in a year. Now, keep in mind, this is just the cash flow. It doesn't account for capital appreciation. But assuming all else stays equal, with any other investment, if you generated a cash flow in the year, you'd have a taxable event. It'd be interest income. You have to add it to your tax bill, right? But with a REIT, we have this thing called return of capital. And it's really just for tax purposes because we're spending money on these properties to improve them, capital expenditures. And when you buy an asset, you're able to take some level of depreciation from it against your balance sheet and your income statement for the year. So when we make profit on our properties, we can use these capital expenditures as well as some of this depreciation to bring our income down to zero. And so when we pay out the investor, it's not interest income, it's effectively a return of capital. So really the two big benefits for an investor is to know that one, as long as we re remain at 100% return of capital, you're able to defer the tax bill until you sell in the future. And here's the kicker, when you do sell because of this return of capital, all of the profit from these distributions will be realized as a capital gain. So it's extremely tax efficient for non-registered investments in Canada. And just a note on the 8 to 12% targeted annual return that we touched on earlier, how exactly does that work, Austin? Yeah, I know it's, it's a really great question because we've definitely talked about the cash flow portion of it and you know how you can see upwards of 6% in terms of a yield paid out monthly. But it's really important to note that that's just one aspect of the return you get with a private REIT. Because you're buying into the units and those units are based on the appraisal value of the property, any time that those appraisal values come back higher, you can actually see an increase in the unit price, kind of like a stock, and that allows for capital appreciation. So when we say we have a target of 8 to 12%, it's really going to be a combination of that consistent cash flow plus any capital appreciation that comes from the underlying properties. I'm actually really excited to say that in 2022, we had a record return if you had reinvested at 13.99% on our class A units, which was over and above our target of eight to 12%. And that's net of all fees. So that's exactly what an investor would have seen in their account. So it was a great sigh of relief for our investors to log in and see those returns. When to the flip side, a lot of their public market holdings had some pretty tough years. And again, that's on the heels of lots of conversations coming up around how are interest rates affecting you? What does that mean for the portfolio? Going back to that financial structure we have, by having 10-year fixed rate mortgages, locking in those interest rates, seeing the exponential boom in rental prices over the last year, it's allowed our company to really prevail and have outstanding returns in what has been an extremely turbulent and tough market. So really happy to say that we've seen record performance in what has been an extremely tough year. Okay, final question, Austin. I'm gonna put myself in the shoes of somebody who's about to buy your fund. Now I'm looking at the stats, you've got an 8 12% annual, targeted annual return, which you've managed to achieve in most, if not all years. The fund itself has outperformed Canadian equities. Uh, private apartments, as we've shown earlier in a graph, private apartments overall have outperformed Canadian equities and global equities. They've been recession proof. We've got a bit, we've got a good macro case for why rental properties will continue to do well in the future. Uh, tax benefits. You know, I, I think of an adage, if something is too good to be true, it probably is. What's the catch? What's the risk here? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a funny question. And, you know, we get it quite frequently here because we deal with, you know, investors from all scopes and different levels. And, you know, we hear it quite often, you know, what, what is the catch, right? And at the end of the day, it's you, you got to realize when you're buying into a private REIT like this, you're not doing it because you're trying to hit a home run every single year. You're not going for the 40 or 50% returns on an annual basis. This is a backbone to a portfolio, and it's one of the most basic necessities for investing. You've got food and shelter. You're investing in the shelter business. And when you get to the scale that we're at now, you know, nearly approaching $1 billion of assets under management, 
you get the benefits of all those things we were previously talking about, which is the consistency and the stability of the valuation of these underlying multifamily properties. You benefit from a monthly cash flow as if you had owned that property yourself. You get the unit price and the potential appreciation based on how well we can manage those properties. So I guess the downside you could say is if you buy into a bad REIT, there's an opportunity for the capital appreciation to go down in a certain year. But thankfully, we've been around for almost seven years. We've never had a negative month in that time frame. You look at the private Canadian apartment index, it's never had a negative year in over 30 years. We want to continue to be a really strong company that continues to just kind of stick by its morals, ethics, growth, and really kind of all these other metrics we have in place to continue to build a really sound investment strategy for people to be able to participate in real estate and not have to deal with the headaches of being a landlord. That's really kind of the beauty of it. All right. Well, Austin, uh, thank you for spending the time today to educate us on the housing market and to explain how your product works. If you'd like to learn more, click on the link down below in the description box. Austin, thanks for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you. David, thanks so much for having me on and uh, really happy to be a part of one of the first podcasts on your channel. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching the David Lynn Report. Stay tuned for more.